Spend time with the Voices of Watch Collecting, a blog to watch's team broaches the most important topics in timepiece enthusiasm today. This is the Spending Time Show. First of all, welcome and thank you very much for coming to the office. I saw everyone with their masks. It is high alert, huh? Yeah, all right. well, actually we have masks when we are uh, together, but when we are alone in the office, as I'm speaking now, uh, it's uh, without a mask. And with a beautiful view over the uh, lake of Neuchâtel, a sunny day, cold day in Switzerland, but a beautiful sight making you in high spirits to start chatting with you. Well, I think that it's wonderful that we can still conduct some businesses normal during this weird time. Rem- think about the stories that we'll have to tell people years from now, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is kind of an adventure, right? <laughs> <laughs> unexpected, unexpected, but you know, life is made of those unexpected uh, incidents, which uh, which then help you shaping the future in a different way and often much better. So let's uh, try to grab the positive out of it. It makes you rethink the meaning of luxury, doesn't it? Well, not only luxury. I mean, uh, <laughs> any kind of activity, lifestyle, and uh, relationship with the people, whether they are colleagues, clients, uh, family. So it's yeah strange break in life because it's like everything uh, was uh, off but on the other end i mean you have to to restart i mean the whole machinery uh in a different context and uh and try to move on which we are trying to you know i'm remembering my long memories of of you in the watch industry Uh, we've both been in it a while now you longer than me and the thing i remember about you the most is the tag hoyer uh, glasses that you would always wear and how I always thought, wow, he wears his own brand so well. What a perfect guy to be in that position. You remember those glasses? Yeah, I remember. And uh, it was a kind of immediate recognition because uh, the shape and the raid uh, were, were part of it. And now if I don't wear glasses anymore, it's not because I don't <laughs> want to, to be signed any longer because Bulgari <laughs> is crafting beautiful eyewear. But just because with aging, uh, my sight is improving better and better. And so I see much better now, 10 years after, than I saw at the time when we met. So uh, that's the only reason why I don't promote the Bulgari eyewear, because I don't just don't need that. <laughs> I, uh, you and me both at the time were wearing glasses, and now we're not. I had the laser eye surgery. I guess it just happened naturally to you. But now we, we no longer have the success, so we're back to only having watches, right? Yeah, that that I mean, still in summertime, I have sunglasses. So don't worry, I keep doing my job and promoting uh, the okay, that's good. sunglasses. Um, so I sent you these questions, and I put a lot of time into thinking about what might be fun to talk about. Um, anything specifically you do or don't want to talk about? Just want to be polite. Well, you know, I, you know, I went through them, and uh, we we can follow your your trace and uh, try to be as crisp uh, as possible and to reveal uh, some clues to our listeners, which makes, I mean, your broadcast uh, very interesting. Wonderful, wonderful. So I'm going to ask the questions as as I wrote them for the benefit of the audience. Number one, okay, don't assume the audience knows who the other JCB is. Give listeners some career background and how you got into watches in the first place. What led to your current position at Bulgari? Right. Well, quite easy. You know, I was French born, graduated from a French MBA pretty early in my life. I was 20 only. Uh, so I embarked first in the army and backpacking around the world just to open my mind to different cultures, way of life. Until I started a real uh, job uh, joining Consumer Goods with Procter and Gamble in France, uh, then Kell in Italy. Uh, and this was between 85 and year 2000. So I had like 15 years of consumer good experience in sales and marketing, uh, cosmetics and laundry detergents, both in uh, Italy and France. And then uh, when I'm, I had moved to Germany and I received a call that uh, a wonderful watch brand named Tiger, which I knew very well because I'm a fanatic of motor racing, was up for grabs. They were looking for a new CEO after LVMH, the French uh, luxury conglomerate, had uh, taken them over. And they were considering that my profile might be fitting uh, with the brand profile. And so we met and he did. Uh, the fit was uh, immediate. And I joined Tiger and therefore the watch industry in November 2000. 
So that was how I got there. And quickly I realized that consumer good and watch industry were not so different except for uh, distribution. Uh, one has to be very exclusive, watches. Consumer good is exactly the opposite. It has to be as broad as possible. Uh, but what makes them quite converging is that if you want to be successful in consumer goods, uh, you really need to pay attention to the tiniest detail and try to turn that detail into something meaningful, relevant, important, so that your brand eventually is preferred to another brand. And in watches, to some extent, because it's only 40, 42 millimeters with uh, a lot of commonalities between the product, that means the crown, the end, the functionality. Eventually, similarly, tiny details can make the difference between a great watch and a very common one. And I have to say that my 15 years of consumer good background has helped me uh, to be detail obsessed and, and therefore, hopefully, to understand that, to elevate Tiger Year to a, a new level of reputation. It was a matter of details, uh, in the aesthetics on the one hand, and obviously the technology on the other end, going to the 1,000 of a second, for instance, which was uh, blowing imagination. And this was uh, the Tiger Year story. I mean, a story of record after record, uh, eight or nine uh, Geneva Watchmaking Grand Prix, the Equidor, Golden End, and uh, a beautiful uh, business success story, which, uh, oh, which owed me when LVMH then acquired Bulgari, uh, that was in 2011, 2012, uh, to propose me the job, on the one hand, to continue on watches, because we have watches in Bulgaria, as you know, and on the other end, obviously, to diversify and use my experience to the benefit of new categories, such as jewelry, leather good accessories, fragrances, and uh, hospitality. So many things. So thank you. That was a great discussion of your background and how you end up Bulgari. Perfect. So let's change the topic to the immediate. It is March 2020, and you in Switzerland, Neuchâtel, and me in Los Angeles, we are in a, a shelter in place where we're supposed to be at home as much as possible. Very strange existence. How is Jean-Christophe Babon spending COVID-19 isolation, and um, how are you managing the past the time? Well, first, I'm very lucky uh, the way I manage COVID isolation in the sense that being in Switzerland, I'm in one of the few European countries where you still benefit from a pretty broad freedom, meaning by that, that I'm not constrained to stay at home. I mean, I can go to the office normally, and I'm talking today from the office. I can drive wherever I want. I can go and see my kids who are living in another city, uh, 60 kilometers away from the Chatel. So even though, I mean, uh, activity is very uh, limited, even though uh, all stores except food and grocery and chemists are closed. Uh, however, in Switzerland, you are still free of moving uh, wherever you want, whenever you want, without any constraint, except that you shouldn't regroup with more than five people. And you are allowed, likewise, uh, to travel. I mean, last week I went to London, to some countries where there are no restrictions as well. So uh, I would say quite lucky and lucky also because uh, Neuchâtel is a uh, headquarter of Bulgaria, which is somehow mirroring the Roma headquarter. It's kind of backup headquarter, hosting usually watches and fer perfumes, but perfectly adapted technologically uh, to run the company worldwide. So uh, actually we have two worldwide headquarters, the Roma one, which is the historical and main headquarter, but operations can be run uh, equally efficiently uh, from Neuchâtel, where we have IT, finance, human resources, general services, and so forth. And uh, those technologies like Zoom, which allow us to carry daily the same meetings we would have done uh, without COVID-19. So in terms of company uh, management and operation, it's like if we had no COVID. As, Interesting. As there's been no disruption so far. Except, I mean, the disruption which have been imposed upon us, like closing stores uh, in some countries, but it's not a decision of ours. It's a decision taken by government uh, to protect, rightly so, uh, their, their citizens. But when it comes to Bulgaria, the company is perfectly operational. And the moment the stores are reopening, within a few hours, uh, we are fully operational uh, to, to be back uh, in business. And so we continue to run the business the way we would have done otherwise. Uh, in half an hour, I have a watches product meeting. So a few people will be together with me in the Neuchâtel office. 
and another 10 will be spread across Europe uh, from home, uh, working uh, smart work, and we'll have uh, a meeting as usual. And the Zoom material we are using is high definition, so uh, we cannot actually touch the watches because it's digital, but the definition is so good that eventually uh, the feedback we get from the other participants of the meeting on the watches, prototype we're going to show, are uh, very, very relevant uh, feedback. And then I have a perfume uh, product meeting on the same line. So two meetings that we run every month. And uh, this time we're running them 100% uh, digital, where uh, usually we used to run those meetings uh, sitting in 12 to 15 people around the table. And I can tell you, believe it or not, the digital approach is more efficient. Uh, oh. we, are more dis we are more disciplined. We are more concentrated, we are more focused, we are more listening, and eventually uh, we get to decisions shorter and better than we used to do the, the old way. <laughs> and this takes me to one of the advantages of this COVID. I mean, uh, this COVID is forcing us into new technologies probably quicker than we would have done otherwise, and probably would change the working habits uh, structurally forever. Once you realize that working from home is something very efficient as long as you are properly equipped. As you realize that you can run a meeting with 20 people from all around the world as efficiently as if those people were flying to Rome, uh, obviously uh, you start realizing that you could save a lot of energy, a lot of time and a lot of costs avoiding those people to travel and just, I mean, organizing these meetings this way. I don't mean by that that it substitutes 100% traveling because uh, sometimes you need really to be with the people uh, physically. We are not robots. On the other hand, I think that post-COVID will mitigate much more than we ever did uh, the physical meetings uh, versus the digital meetings. It's great to hear you say that. Um, I want to ask you, and first of all, I agree with you. So thank you for saying all that. But I'm so curious what emotion you felt when you looked at the watch stores you know, in the city, these places that were, you know, open all the time. This is almost like by law, the watch stores in Switzerland are open and they're all closed. What's the emotion that you had? Well, you know, it, it goes beyond the watch stores. It's just like, uh, and I had the sensation last Friday when I flew from Geneva to London, uh, that it was somehow kind of ghost airport and ghost city <laughs> uh, with, with all the shutters down. And you know, whether it's a watch store or a furniture store or a high fidelity store, the shutters are the same for everyone. So you hardly make any difference. But the feeling you get is that a kind of day after feeling that everything <laughs> is, is shut down. There are no people in the streets. Uh, in the airport itself, maybe there were five passengers and one security guy for the flight to London. So it's like if you are the last survivor. <laughs> 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 it, it, uh, it, it, and it's it's a strange feeling indeed because yeah. eventually uh, nothing major has happened. I mean, we don't talk about I mean a tsunami like in 2012 movie. It's not like a nuclear war or uh, <laughs> or a meteorite which have engulfed the planet. I mean, into total destruction. Uh, everything is working. Everything is functioning. The air uh, pollution has never been so low in the last decade, but the planet is locked and everything looks empty and shut down. Uh, and it's a very strange feeling. Yeah, no, I, 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 I hear you. And you have your own experience and in, you know, LA where I grew up, I have mine seeing a city a way that it, it shouldn't be like, it shouldn't be that empty. Like it's like, there's clearly something wrong, you know? So uh, you were talking about this wonderful development where now watch brands realize the efficiency of remote meetings. And it takes us to the topic of issues the watch industry was having before all of this is going on. And, and I know that as a smart manager, you were aware of these things over the last couple of years. What is it that, that you sort of noticed? Um, when did you sort of realize something was going on that you as a manager had to do something with your brand to steer it in a, in the, in a better direction? You mean before the COVID or just... Yeah, the... I mean, look, the, the watch industry has been going through several phases of crisis, yeah. been widely reported on. Some brands are doing better than others. But, you know, you always need to stay ahead of this. And I know you're the type of person that generally stays ahead of this. At what point did you realize that there was an issue in the industry that required, you know, or would require a lot of your attention? Well, basically, I, I think that after 2008, that is the global financial uh, crisis, uh, something broke. 
And what did break uh, has been the interest of the Western clients to the watch industry. And this has not shown too much initially as the Chinese more than offset and compensated for the declining interest of Westerners uh, to luxury watches to the point that the watch market from 2008 to 2012 kept growing very, very steadily. And then uh, all of a sudden in 2012, Uh, It stopped again, uh, and everyone started to think that what's happening, because in 2012, there's been no crisis, no virus, uh, no starving, uh, no war, so nothing special, to realize that between 8 and 12, most of the growth of the watch industry has been driven by Chinese. And Chinese not only buying for themselves, but Chinese buying also for gifting, which is a long-established tradition in China, uh, within a company. If I were Chinese in 2008 or 9 or 10, it would be expected from my boss that in certain occasion I would gift him or gift her something. Then in 2012, I mean, the Chinese government put uh, an halt to that, considering that it was somehow uh, comparable to corruption. And uh, all the products which were involved in this cooperative gifting, which is first, obviously, uh, did take a very, very negative hurt uh, because the volumes involved then were very important. And uh, in 2012, uh, we found ourselves in a situation where on the one hand, we were still uh, lacking the clients from the West who basically didn't come to the industry after the global financial crisis. And we started to lose also the corporate gifting business uh, from China. And this led to the famous four, five years of stagnation, uh, where looking at Swiss export, we can see that the industry has been totally sluggish over the last five years, in stark contrast uh, compared to the other luxury industries, which in the meanwhile, from jewelry to fashion, to hospitality, uh, to shoes, have been blossoming uh, until uh, three months ago. So. My takeout was, and this is how Bulgari came with a rinascimento of Swiss watchmaking by the Italian jeweler, that we really needed a real renaissance to make the watches relevant again. Uh, because probably between the financial crisis and then the Chinese gifting corporate period, uh, compared to other categories, watches had lost some relevance, especially to new generation. So some relevance came from Apple, because Apple, uh, with the collected watch, brought some new ways of wearing a watch with functionalities which were not even connected to watch, but we somehow provided you with a reason to have something around your wrist. And that's why uh, when it started, I was one of the first to welcome the uh, connected watches, because for me, they wouldn't cannibalize the traditional watches, but they would be rather a first entry into uh, something on your wrist, which was giving you time. And then uh, in parallel to that initiative, which obviously uh, was totally external to Bulgaria and to the Swiss watch industry, at Bulgari, we really tried hard to reinvent ourselves, uh, to provide clients with uh, a new relevance stemming from a way of designing uh, watches which had never been ventured before. And that way was very Italian, meaning that instead of designing it again and again and again, those round watches that we had seen uh, for two centuries, to restart from a blank page, capitalizing on some jewelry or Roman symbols, and turn them into the new contemporary watches of the future 21st century. And this is the story of Sepenti, which was born out of Egyptian jewelry brought to Rome 2,000 years ago by Queen Cleopatra. This is a story of Octo, which was born, I mean, from uh, the settings of Pantheon Temple and the Maxentius Basilicate. And besides the aesthetic, obviously, the mechanics, that is to reinvent also uh, the movements so that in the relevance of the Bulgari watch, there would be a new dimension that no brand uh, was proposing, which was contemporary elegance. So basically, it gave birth to the Serpenti, which in the ladies' watch uh, market is totally new and breaking any rule ever established before. And it has become Bulgari's bestseller overall, and obviously as a ladies' watch. And Octo, inspired by uh, Roman architecture, 
but at the same time uh, borrowing to Italian fashion, the slim fit uh, approach, which is the new uh, reference for elegant men, and becoming the thinnest ever uh, watch, thus establish a relevance of its own, uh, which raised a lot of consumer interest. So basically what we did, we forgot about the models we had until the late 2000 uh, and early 2010 to give birth to a totally new portfolio of designs who were totally unexpected in the Swiss watch industry and uh, legitimate only if you were an Italian brand because a snake as much as an octagonal watch makes sense uh, if you are Roman uh, or Italian. <laughs> no, because because uh, the legitimacy of those two shapes is an antique Roman and Egyptian legitimacy, but surely not, I mean, uh, a bien or Geneva or Neuchâtel legitimacy. And we were the only one we could dare to try that new approach just because being Italian and not being a pure player, but also uh, a major brand in jewelry, uh, we could absolutely afford, I mean, to dare without undermining our credibility. And this has proven very successful. And Bulgari is probably one of those brands which has provided to the market some new, more reasons to buy a, a luxury watch, which is something that was losing uh, traction in the last 10 years. I, I really hope that people listen carefully to what you say. There's so many important things that you talk about, especially if you know the context. I just want to thank you for all the detail. I, I'm, I'm very interested in what you have to say. You mentioned something interesting about the Westerners. Um, losing interest in luxury watches where one generation to the next there seems to be a drop off what do you i mean you may not know the exact answer but what do your suspicion happened one generation had one type of relationship with luxury and what was lost in the next generation well i think that what's striking when i look at today's world is the speed of change in anything surrounding you we were talking before about zoom allowing uh, to run meetings with 20 people, remote, uh, distance, uh, 10,000 kilometers away. I mean, everything has changed in our environment uh, in the last 20 years, except the watch. And the watch remains exactly what it has ever been. Uh, and most best-selling watches, by the way, uh, were invented in the 60s, in the 70s, in the 80s. So basically, if you are a client of the 21st century, uh, you are most likely to wear a watch of uh, the mid-late 20th century. And this is the only category where you find, I mean, this dichotomy between a world where from architecture to the device surrounding you, to digital, uh, to transportation, everything has changed, but the watch didn't change. So you may argue fantastic because it shows that it's timeless and it's, uh, it's reassuring. On the other hand, uh, compared to jewelry, which somehow has a similar slow evolution like a watch, it's not jewelry. Jewelry, let's never forget, is made of precious stones, which are gaining value over time. Uh, it's made of gold. It's made of platinum. It's really timeless by all means, because whatever happens, you will have a residual value uh, of jewelry because of the material which are used. And jewelry has ever uh, been associated in the last 15,000 years to the celebration of the most emotional moments in life. And therefore... A uh, jewelry can afford to have a slow pace uh, in the world because jewelry has been slowly developing and growing this successful across 15,000 years uh, because it's based on emotions and on the most important emotions related to the mating of a man and a woman or two men together, two women together, whatever. Uh, but uh, jewelry is visceral. Watchmaking is different. Watchmaking was born as non-emotional but functional. And today, uh, on functionality, watchmaking is lagging behind thousands of connected objects, which are, <laughs> providing, which are providing time as good as, if not better than. But on the other hand, it has never managed to reach the visceral status of desirability of jewelry. First, because uh, many watches are not precious. Uh, they are just made of steel. They are not timeless. And they are not associated uh, to emotional moments of life, primarily because they are very serious. Uh, the designs are very conservative, and most of them are very masculine. Even ladies' watches, 90%, are just derived from men watches made a bit smaller 
and uh, decorated a bit more feminine. But you don't have, I mean, in uh, watches the same excitement, the same emotion, the same hype uh, that you can find uh, in jewelry, and surely not, I mean, the same creativity you can find in fashion. And this is where the watches, they found themselves a bit squeezed between uh, accelerating jewelry, accelerating fashion, and, generally speaking, accelerating uh, clients and found themselves like considered as kind of a bit uh, a category of the century before. Can I point something out interesting that I was thinking about while you were saying this? I, again, totally agree, and I've never heard that specific analysis of jewelry. But I've noticed it in the West, especially in media, there is a ritualization of these um, yeah, instances to buy jewelry. So if, uh, the best example is the engagement. Mm-hmm. Right? We have ritualized it in media so that anyone growing up knows that this ritual that is supposed to happen to you once in your life comes with either the purchase or the acceptance of this jewelry. And there's these other rituals as well, birthdays, anniversaries, whatnot. Yeah, exactly. So there's so many for jewelry. But in the West, and I think we can agree growing, having both grown up in different parts of the West, for men, there's no ritualized ceremony to receive a watch. Even if it's something that men do, it's supposed to just be something you do privately, discreetly. It's not a public thing. So maybe one answer to making watches more relevant is to ritualize some ceremony where the expected thing to do during or after the ceremony is to get a watch. Just I a think, thought. Uh, I think that is for sure. I mean, and it used to be because I remember when I was myself 12 or 14, I got my first watch when I did what we saw as uh, as Christians, my first communion. That is the first time, I mean, you eat God's bread uh, at church. And, and in traditional French families, typically, uh, you were gifted a watch. So uh, so you're never late? <laughs> no, no. So, so what I mean that this did exist, right? Right. Uh, and then in the 80s, if you remember, uh, especially in countries like Italy, you had another ritual, which was a graduation watch, which also uh, was very much present in the United States. But I think that this uh, has eroded, if not disappeared, first because there are less people uh, getting into religion pretty young, and second, because at graduation, probably today, students are more interested by buying the new version of the iMac uh, rather than buying a backpack and going for six months before they will look for the first job. So probably the paradigm revolving around graduation is not any longer a kind of institutional object like a watch, but more something that you're going to enjoy the next morning. can be the last generation of a, a computer, can be around the world ticket for six months before you will apply for a job. But probably, I mean, uh, your uh, top of mind in terms of desire post-graduation uh, has shifted to the so many alternatives today existing to a 10,000 uh, euro or dollars uh, watch purchase. That, that, that's interesting. I, I Again, I love hearing about your analysis. So in terms of timepieces, you mentioned that, you know, Bulgari is a company that makes many things. Uh, timepiece is not, is not the biggest category, but obviously takes a lot of time. And I know it's a category you love. How much of your time do you, do you distribute to watches? And, and how do you do that? Do you take whole days and weeks? You just give a little bit a day? You know, tell, well, the, uh, tell the audience. Well, first, uh, you know, watch and perfume are located in Switzerland, uh, fashion accessories in Tuscany, Firenze, and uh, hotels and jewelry in Rome. So basically, we have three major headquarters and as CEO, uh, overlooking product development for all categories. I regularly shuttle from one city to the other. So there's only one week staying in one country only when I'm not traveling internationally. So uh, my time speed between the, the five categories, generally speaking, is about equal, uh, regardless of their importance in the turnover, uh, because what's important is their strategic importance uh, and not so much, I mean, the, the weight uh, they represent today in turnover. So I would say probably 15 to 20% of my time is on watches, but uh, I would spend uh, about the same on fragrances or accessories a bit more jewelry, but not proportional to uh, the overwhelming weight of jewelry in our turnover. Right. And I would spend also maybe 10% of my time on the hospitality, which is an activity today with eight hotels, which is not yet 
as big as watches or as, as fragrances. Uh, so I would say the time you spend is more people related than turnover related. And it's more project related um, than turnover related. In watches, we have many projects. We have a strong ambition. We believe that the uh, Rinascimento, the renaissance of Swiss watchmaking by Bulgari is only at the very first footsteps. And we have many, many new initiatives in the pipes. Some we disclosed in January in Dubai during the LVMH Watch Week. Others, hopefully, we're going to uh, disclose them end of August in Geneva for the Geneva Watch Days. And, and therefore, uh, with that ambition in mind, regardless of the turnover of the watches, I myself spend a lot of time on watches because I'm convinced that A, they are very strategic. B, we have a huge potential because we have a style of our own uh, combined with the best excellence of uh, pure Swiss watchmakers. And, and three, because we are the only or virtually the one of the few pure feminine brands doesn't prevent us to do very, very attractive men's uh, watches. I think Octo is well uh, epitomizing that. And you're going to see a, end of August a brand new collection for men, totally different from Octo, which also hopefully will make history. Uh, so we pay attention to men. But the fact is that we are born out of a lady, whereas the, <laughs> the competitors are born out of a man. And this is totally different. And this makes our assortment very relevant and complementary to the retailers uh, because they need to attract ladies in their stores. Otherwise, their stores would be uh, more men's clubs than uh, watch stores. <laughs> and, and thanks to brands like Bulgari, they have a strong argument to attract, invite, and have ladies crossing their doors and, uh, and discovering their own. Whether they will buy a ladies watch from Bulgari or a men's watch for their husband or boyfriend, then is another story, and I wish both. Uh, but fact is that we have a very unique role to play for our retailers, as we are one of the few brands which dedicates uh, a lot of its creativity to ladies. So how do you train a man to buy from what you say is a feminine brand? You and I are okay with it, something we figured out a long time ago. But you know, this is one of the most interesting like sort of reactions in the watch enthusiast community is yeah yeah I like it yeah yeah it seems to have a great movement but isn't it a a a, a feminine brand and there's some type of hurdle that as a collector you need to overcome for this how does one do this well uh, obviously uh, you have to prove that you are not only I mean uh, very skilled at designing beautiful timeless watches like Lucia Serpenti Diva for ladies, but that behind, I mean, uh, th those beautiful designs, you have a real uh, watchmaking company perfectly uh, mastering the highest uh, expertise in uh, complicated watchmaking. And that's why together with those ladies watches, uh, we pay a lot of attention and energy on developing grand complication, chimes, Westminster Carbillon, mini tributaries. And we permanently involve on the masculine side, uh, not only in thinness with the finissimo range, but also in materials uh, with carbon, with titanium, uh, with ceramics, so that uh, a man willing to buy a Serpenti or a Lucia or a Diva from Bulgari knows that the manufacturer behind those uh, jewels of time is also one of the few companies in Switzerland capable to craft uh, a Carillon Westminster or a Grand Sonnerie. And, uh, and that's a fact, a fact that we try, obviously, to publicize as much as we do uh, through creativity, through uh, promotion, uh, through a lot of one-to-one -one meetings, participating to fairs, making sure that in our high jewelry events, the iron watches are also very much protagonists of the event as most of our clients joining the hydro events are couples so we do a lot so that that dimension of bulgari be more and more known acknowledged and admired uh, as uh, in the field of grand sonnery uh, fact is that bulgari is clearly in the top five well the watch that i'm wearing right now is probably with the most masculine watches I have, and it's a Bulgari. It's the Diagono X-Pro. And so I learned a long time ago that this is a brand that could do manly very well. And I, it's interesting you say that because I, you know, oftentimes I sort of speak for the, the collector and community. 
And I think there's a way of looking at the brand as not purely seeing it as a feminine brand. It is a brand that makes very feminine things. And it understands that to, a man, to attract many men, you need to have feminine lines, even in a man's product. Well, this I mean, is a we, key thing. On the other hand, <laughs> you know, I have we are uh, conscious that because of our feminine DNA born out of jewelry, probably will ever be a bit more feminine than masculine, uh, which is logical. I mean, right. it's more, but it's not a problem. Uh, it's not a problem. It's not a problem as long as what we craft for men, and it's true for watches with Octo, with what you're going to discover in of August, the new collection. It's true for fragrances where franchises like Man are extremely successful. We are acknowledged by many men as a brand which is feminine, yes, but often also unisex. And I think the success uh, of our watches, of some of our jewelry, uh, and of our fragrance is that we are not perceived as a macho brand, surely not, but we are not perceived as the kind of delicate, feminine, fragile uh, brand only. You know, right, we are not right. felt, Bulgari is not felt as a romantic brand. Bulgari right. is felt as a strong, Roman, magnificent brand, uh, which has inherited the joy of life, the Dolce Vita, and uh, the daringness uh, of Roma and Romans. So no one would expect from Bulgari a little tiny romantic watch for ladies. No, our watches for ladies, Serpenti, Lucia, are very strong statements. It's like very... the architecture. It's like the yeah. architecture. Okay, so, so the fact that our feminine side is very strongly architectured with a very strong pedigree in the design naturally provides us with a lot of credibility when we design men watches. Absolutely. Uh, if we were designing classical, tiny, fragile, kawaii ladies' watches, perhaps it would be more difficult to be credible as a men's watch uh, manufacturer. The fact that, conversely, all ladies' watches have in common with the men's watches, the very strong artistic and architectural thread allows uh, the masculine part to be uh, legitimate and credible. So let's talk about August a little bit. I'm sure that you personally were devastated by the cancellation of of Watches and Wonders. You were devastated by the cancellation of Geneva Watch Days. Now, hopefully in August, there'll be something else. Uh, you're going to make it happen either way. I know you obviously cannot break the news, but what can you tell us about what you were going to say or what you will say uh, in August in Geneva? Well, uh, first, I hope uh, we'll confirm uh, Geneva because, you know, with the COVID, first, it was right to postpone to August because we see that the peak will be reached probably in April in Europe. And therefore, uh, running it end of uh, June was a bit too early because uh, it's one thing uh, to get to the peak of the epidemic uh, and then you need the epidemic to get under control and then to be eradicated. And last but not least, people also to eradicate the epidemic from their minds. So it's a two to three months process. And for that reason, we decided it would be wise to postpone from um, end of uh, June rather to end of August to have two more months buffer, leaving more time to the epidemic to fade away as an epidemic on the one hand and as a bad memory on the other end. Now, uh, said that and hoping it will happen like that, I'm very excited because already in January in Dubai, the LVMH Watch Week has been extremely successful with four brands only, but four brands which were very complementary and uh, had the chance to build a very qualitative relationship with the retailers and media joining the event. You know, it was not the big Basel Fair or ACHH. No, it was uh, on a small scale with about 250 guests, 120 retailers, 130 media. So let's say medium sized. And what we lost in quantity, we gained a lot in uh, quality to the point that uh, the media coverage we got from that event was by all means very comparable to what we usually uh, get from Basel. Even though, I mean, uh, the attendance in terms of media was much, much less than Basel. So I'm expecting more or less of the same uh, for the second round, uh, the Geneva Watch Days, which again, Bulgari uh, has been leading into the organization, uh, where we're going to present a lot of pieces we couldn't present in January because they were not yet ready. 
two retailers who were not necessarily present as well in January. So for some retailers, they will discover additional news, plus they will view again some pieces they've seen in January, and for some media as well, and some will discover entirely. So it means that after the Geneva Watch Days, 90% of our major retailers and 90% of the uh, influencers and media which really shape the watch industry will be perfectly aware of Bulgari 2020 news and perfectly prepared to promote, to sell them uh, by Christmas so that the second half of the year commercially for Bulgari and the participating brand will be much better than the first half and that those brands which have been daring in January organizing a fair at the MH Watch Week and in August organizing another fair Jeva Wedges will be the winners of the year when measured uh, in terms of market share gains. Interesting. That makes sense. So there, you know, this invitation uh, that went out specifically said Gerald Genta on there as a participant in this Geneva Watch Days. And Gerald Genta is a brand that, that Bulgari had acquired, of course, since before uh, you joined. And it had it, it, yep. it, had it as, uh, as part of the asset along with Daniel Roth. And there's been a lot of questions about what's going on with that. Because if you do an analysis of the terms mentioned in watch media over the last year, Gerald Genta has come up so many times because of the watches that, that he designed, uh, for example, yep. the Royal Atlas and things like that. So you, being, of course, an, an enterprising and clever business person, have probably been thinking about what to do with this asset. And I'd love to hear about what your, what your thoughts are. Well, I mean, we're conscious that Genta is uh, obviously a very, very valuable asset and equity for the shareholder of Genta, and in that case, Bulgari, because we are owning uh, the Genta brand. And like in watchmaking, you know, uh, there is a time for some things. And in the beginning of the pre-acquisition, uh, post-acquisition days, the priority was really to understand and integrate the Genta and World watchmaking excellence and know-how to really uh, upgrade and uplift and uh, speed up Bulgari roads into true watchmaking. And this has given birth to the beautiful success story we are talking about uh, now uh, in that discussion on, on Bulgari watches. And this was a step one, keeping Genta uh, and Rod aside and putting most of the expertise, all the creativity and the financial resource behind building Bulgari as Bulgari watches add obviously more potential than Genta watches or Rod watches. Why? because Bulgari uh, was already a huge name in uh, jewelry. Bulgari had already 100 years of experience in jewelry watches, so we had credentials in jewelry watches. But we were missing, yes, credibility in terms of mechanical, complicated watchmaking, which we acquired from the Genta and, and Roth expertise. And for virtually 15 years, uh, we have put all our energy to absorb, integrate, develop, uh, that know-how, which eventually gave birth to the Finissimo and to complicated Bulgari watches, uh, which do not buy the components from other brands or movement from other brands, but who are capable to envision and develop incredible new watch mechanical movement. And I think that what we presented in uh, Dubai, the Serpenti mechanical tourbillon, is typically emblematic of this know-how development of Bulgari, uh, in complicated mechanical movement, the same way a minute repeater or a finissimo choreograph. Now it's time to obviously revive Genta, which we did last year, uh, celebrating the 50 years of the first Genta watch, uh, and the limited edition, which you have seen, uh, Platinum uh, Arena 50 watch, distributed only in our stores. Purposely a very exclusive uh, and very expensive watch. Uh, the point was not so much, I mean, to sell to the masses. The point was to uh, celebrate uh, a great talent, Gerald Genta, a great chef, uh, the arena, reinterpreted by a great brand, Bulgari, uh, who is owning that asset, Genta. This was very successful. I mean, not only uh, in terms of esteem, in terms of appraisal from uh, watch connoisseurs, from the media community, from the influencers, the bloggers, but also from clients. I mean, most have been sold in so far. 
And that's why we decided that we should go to step two, which is to propose a new arena, but markedly different from the 50, open to a broader public, uh, using different materials and visibly different in style as much as more affordable in price. And this arena uh, will be uh, unveiled in Geneva together with the Octo world record I was mentioning earlier and together with the new Bulgari men's watch collection I was mentioning. So those will be the three major novelties of Bulgari for the Geneva watch days. Wonderful, wonderful. Final, final question. I want to thank you again for your time. I think everyone listening probably found this fascinating. I want them to listen a few times because as you know, most other watch managers don't have as many th- interesting and smart things to say as you. Um, <laughs> you have been actually quite humble compared to some of your colleagues, even though I think you're a more and more capable manager than many. Uh, but for many years, you shared um, the 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 <laughs> the you know, the letters JCB with the other JCP, uh, Jean-Claude Biver, uh, ironically under LVMH for much of the time. And you two- That was quite funny. That was a funny coincidence. Yeah, 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 super. Some people got confused. I I understood, but, um, you know, he has has definitely a very tall shadow and he is no longer, um, you know, an active manager in the watch industry. You, of course, are. And so- because he is such a loud personality and so many people know of him and know him to be a good manager, why don't you just compare and contrast a little bit? Obviously, you have a lot of professional respect for him, but tell tell people who are watch lovers a few ways where you and, and Jean-Claude Biver, you know, definitely see eye to eye, but some ways that Jean-Christophe Babon and Jean-Claude Biver are two very different people. Well, uh, you're right that there is uh, a reciprocal esteem, which is very strong between the two of us. We know each other pretty well, as you can imagine. I think that there are three dimensions where we are very similar. For sure, we are equally passionate, uh, not only watchmaking passionate, but we are passionate of life, we are passionate of culture, we are passionate of philosophy, we are passionate about discovering, uh, about curiosity, about trekking in the mountains. So... We are driven by passion. And uh, I think uh, our leadership, because uh, I consider both of us as very strong leaders, is very much stemming from that contagious passion uh, that uh, we display whenever uh, we talk or address uh, any topic uh, we are asked to to comment or or discuss. The second is that we are very committed. uh, When we want to achieve something, we uh, put all resources and chances on our side to make it happen. And uh, we are totally determined and would uh, work days and nights with our teams to make uh, the impossible happen. Uh, Jean-Claude did the connected watch against all odds. I did the 1,000th of a second on his brand before I joined. And then I did the thinnest watches in the world in my new company. So. When we have a vision, uh, we are totally committed, determined, and would work above and beyond the 24 hours if it were possible to make that happen. (laughs) And last but not least, probably we are both very extroverse. Uh, We have our intimacy, and uh, we have our private life that probably uh, we don't like too much to to disclose because it's really uh, the depths of our soul, but on the other end, we are accessible, approachable, uh, extremely extrovert, uh, pretty joyful, and, uh, and not surprisingly attractive to the retailers, to the media, because uh, usually we have good time with the people we, we spend time with. Now, uh, if we look at the differences, obviously, uh, we are very different, perhaps because we are born from two different generations, not even, I mean, one and all, uh, but more uh, in terms of character. Uh, I'm surely someone very managerial. I build my ideas out of listening and observing. Uh, and then it becomes an idea. Jean-Claude is more impulsive and intuitive and more uh, somehow an entrepreneur. Uh, and I'm more a manager. Uh, and I think both in the right context are equally interesting and can be equally successful. I mean, Jean-Claude has been hugely successful uh, with Zublo. I've been extremely successful with Tiger Year and Bulgari, so uh, successes cannot be denied, uh, but the approach to the success has been a bit different. I'm a bit more analytical, a bit more disciplined, and uh, I never take a decision or follow an intuition 
if it's not backed by some information, listening, inside clues that I pick up in the workshops or the market, and trying to integrate it to really uh, shape and refine my idea to the point uh, I would decide the idea would become a project. Jean-Claude is much quicker, perhaps also because he has more experience, and uh, intuitively will wake up a morning and say, okay, let's do that, and he does it. And this is where perhaps we, we are uh, the most different. Interesting, interesting. And uh, finally, because this is to a watch collector community, what type of feedback are you and the timepiece team at Bulgari looking for? What do you want to hear from consumers? Do you want to hear feedback about designs or marketing? You obviously want to make products that, that, you know, that match their, their desires and expectations. Tell them how to help you. Well, anything, you know, uh, the first thing um, I'm doing myself when I'm visiting the markets is to stay a lot of time in those stores to listen to uh, clients' comments when they are uh, interfacing with the sales staff. And then right after, uh, to, to ask as much question to the sales staff on uh, what have been the verbatims, the comments of the client to the watch that were proposed, whether they eventually bought the watch uh, or not. And so what I like in digital, what I like in blogs, is this kind of direct feedback I can get from uh, potential clients, from watch lovers, on what Bulgari does. And I'm the first one very open to critic. I love critic. Uh, I love myself sometimes uh, going to polemic uh, because I think that debating is a funny art as long as you respect the other. Uh, so I would be the first open, you know, to enter into debates as long as the spirit is constructive. Uh, I think that uh, a lot of positive gets out of differences. Absolutely. Uh, and so for me, the more I get feedback, and especially if it's negative, the better I feel, because from negative feedback, I can think, I can react, I can share with my colleagues. I can try also to dig deeper to better understand what is the underlying frustration behind the negative feedback, and eventually come up with some solutions which will make those people frustrated, happier, Next time, they will have a Bulgari watch experiences. So please, anything that can provide us more direct feedback, also talking directly with clients. I mean, uh, I love to, to take my, my phone and answer myself directly to a frustrated client because it's hugely important for me not to sit in an ivory tower, but to be, I mean, in the middle of my watch makers and masters. And uh, like them, I mean, to wear the burdens and the glory of what we try to achieve together. That is very approachable and very down to earth. This has been a conversation with Jean-Christophe Baban, the group CEO of Bulgari. Thank you very much for joining us. Oh, yeah, thank you. And thank you everyone for uh, following that blog. It was great to, to have you as an audience. Thank you.